Listen to everybody present, I kind of realized like I didn't prepare anything to like tell everybody who I was, and I was like, so that's a great idea. I should tell people my name and stuff. So hey, I'm Ian. I do AI and games sometimes together, sometimes apart, just for various things. Um, I don't have a cool fancy job title, but I do have a cool fancy subject I'd love to talk to you about today. So what we're going to talk about is what AI is, what it isn't, how it's working with games, and then we're going to play a game at the end. So hopefully people like games. I think a great place to start with uh, what it is is just getting a very basic definition. So in computer science, AI is something that simulates natural intelligence. And when I say simulates natural intelligence, that doesn't really, it can be very simple or very broad. So it could be something that just randomly chooses how to play rock, paper, scissors. It's, you know, okay, I got one. Well, we're picking scissors or something, you know, is like the whole human experience. We're just sort of focused on simulating some aspect of natural intelligence. And under that, we have two big categories. And the first big category we have is what we call general intelligence. And general intelligence, you can see in media, pretty commonly in stuff like Skynet, if you watch Terminator, or Cortana, not the Microsoft one, the Halo one. And just pretty much anything you see that's like very human-like is going to be something that is you know, probably generally intelligent. There's not like really a specific consensus. And can I zoom in this browser here? People read that? Yeah. A little better? OK, awesome. So like I said, there's not really any specific consensus on what general intelligence is. Generally, think about it as thinking that is as flexible and as skillful as a human's. And if you can make this, you would have done what we call solve the field of AI. So all the problems in it would be done, because you would have invented the biggest, baddest thing. Um, below that, we have some questions to ask. Those are just kind of thought experiments you can use to sort of, you know, tell if, you know, a robot is generally intelligent or not. Kind of the thing to focus on is, you know, how does it have novel ideas? Does it have a clear understanding of abstract reasoning? You know, can it, like, you know, get above the conversation and sort of work its way back in? And can it improve its own learning, apply related skills? A cool trick to see if this exists, you know, if it's generally intelligent in real life, it's not because it doesn't exist yet, but we do have something that does exist. So that'll be, we call it narrow AI. And the reason we call it narrow AI is because it's good at one specific kind of task. Now this could be something as specific as it is really, really good at playing the cat lady game, or maybe it's just really, really good at playing two player games, or, but it's some general category. And, Generally speaking, the more broad and abstract you get, the harder it is to make. Um, the, what you can do with this is pretty much innumerable. So you, know, you can classify autism. You can look at various factors and learn from that and say, you know, based on this, I'm going to make a prediction about what this is. Or I can you know, recognize faces, like what FaceApp will do here you know, is we learn from faces to you know, see what is a face, like what compromises that. Um, and gameplay. Gameplay is you know, probably what you're here for. And, there are a lot of really interesting things. My favorite example is AlphaStar. And the reason I like AlphaStar so much is because it's one of the great examples of where AI achieves superhuman level performance in games. So that's you know, pretty hard to do, and there are you know, a lot of reasons for that. But a cool thing that can happen when you have robots get to that level is sometimes they will not only outperform humans, but they will learn and discover strategies that previously were unknown. So I forget what the game was called specifically, but there was a game where it got better than all the best players in the world, and the best players are like, wait a second, wait, why did they think of that? And then they learn from the bot, and they learn how to play the game better. So that's you know, something that's really interesting. But generally speaking, making opponents that are impossibly powerful is just you know, bad game design. So what we want to shoot for is something that is human-like, something that will behave like a human, which will draw our audiences in and make them feel like they're a part of the experience. And below here, I just have some more you know, quick questions to Tell you know, sort of just think about is something narrow or not? And the one I really want to pay attention to here is number three. And the reason I want to pay attention to number three, it gets you know refers back to what I said about intelligence, you know, AI in the first place, is that it's something that simulates intelligence. So if you do the same thing over and over without any kind of variation, you know, and expect different result, you know, what did Einstein say about that? Madness. So you know, we don't we won't really call something that only does one thing one way. So if I walk forward and then turn left and take one step. 
We wouldn't really call that intelligent behavior because it's I do one thing and only one thing. Now, in this, we have like several big, broad categories. And I'll get through these real quick, so we get to the fun part. So we have the creatively named artificial intelligence category. And the real defining characteristic of this is it's AI that doesn't learn. So it's something that's going to look at its environment and then sort of use information about that environment to sort of guess at what it should do. So if, you know, if I have a 2D volleyball game, you know, it might be fine just to say, hey, that's a volleyball over there. I should probably be under that ball, so I'm going to move in this direction. But you know, when we try and get to different games and different things, you know, we kind of discover that making this is really, really hard because it gets really complicated really fast. Also, we kind of discover that you know, there are other ways we can get things to learn to do tasks. And that brings me to the next big category, which we call you know, intelligent or you know, machine learning. And this kind of AI uses information to automatically improve its ability to do something. And the cool thing about this is you don't really tell it what to do. What you do is you take it and you throw it in an environment and then it learns to do it on its own. So like you would write an ML algorithm, you would set it up with a game of like Snake or whatever and just leave it alone for maybe however long and it's gonna figure out how to play Snake without any kind of prompt. And that's you know, pretty cool if you think about it. It's just it's learning the rules you know, based on trial and error. Now this is generally something we use for more complicated things. So chat by, you know, classification, like I said, facial recognition and Facebook friend suggestions. That uses something called k-means classifying. And a step below that, just kind of like, I want you to engage your sort of geometrical thinking here. And we say like we have machine learning and then we have deep learning. The real big difference between those two is how deep it is. So if we have like say a tunnel and the tunnel's like two feet long, okay, maybe that's something that's machine learning. But if it's deep learning, that tunnel's probably going to be about, you know, maybe a mile long. It's something that's going to be much, you know, some, some relatively length deeper. And it doesn't really matter how big it is. It could be a small pipe. It could be, you know, an underpass through a mountain. What we're really focusing on here is how deep it is. And these are generally useful for the most complicated tasks, like figuring out how to do something in Adobe Illustrator. So if you want to figure out how to do, you know, something that takes a lot of steps, you would use you know, some sort of deep learning algorithm to do that. And some cool examples, you can see Google Deep Dream. It tries to figure out what a machine sees when it looks at things, and it looks kind of like a Picasso painting. It's really interesting. But the even more thing is that it relates to games, which is deep reinforcement, which is sort of, you know, over a long period of time, how do we maximize some kind of reward? And this is how you can take something without any knowledge of any kind of game and you know, it will figure out, it will say, okay, I did this and got a reward, so I'm gonna do more of that. And you know, over thousands of millions of games or however many it does, it's you know, hopefully gonna get really good at that. Now, I've been going at you with terms for a while here, so I'm gonna get down to some real world applications, some things you're gonna see in the common world. So, monitoring pictures and posts on social media. This is really cool because, well, it's, really easy because especially on platforms like Twitter, pretty much everything is publicly available. So one of my friends, she works in Tokyo, her entire business is to have a machine go over at least the Japanese part of Twitter and it's gonna you know, use its brains to sort of figure out what people are doing in pictures. So it might, if I posted a picture of myself right now, it's gonna see, hey, person, 25, males, random things like that. Oh, holding a microphone, what brand is that? It's Sure Microphone. So if you are looking over like hundreds of thousands of pictures, you can you know, get really interesting insights about what people are doing in real time. So she'll go through the Twitter, Twitter crunch all that, and then use, it'll make predictions and about what people are doing in the current time. So it's like, hey, right now people are using short microphones. They're wearing clip-ons. They're wearing brown shirts. Now this information she can then turn around and sell to companies. And that's you know, basically her business model. Uh, grocery stores tracking your purchases. So anybody here shop at Kroger or Walmart? If you have a trading card, not a trading card, that's totally wrong word, the, a rewards card, what they're gonna do with that information is scoop up your purchases um, and feed that into something they call Deep Dive. And what Deep Dive does is it's gonna take all the information about everything you buy and everything everybody buys who uses it and it's going to feed it into something, you know, mountains of information that's not really usable with, by a person it's going to feed it into a machine who's gonna analyze that used to make predictions. So it's like, okay, people are buying a lot of crab in the Northwest. What are people gonna buy next? That's what Kroger is gonna to wanna to know. So then they're gonna say, okay, maybe they're gonna buy butter or something. And you know, if you use their apps, they're also crawling through that. Um, one other thing that can be done and is done is reading your emails. So what, what Google will do, at least to train predictive text AI, 
is they will read through your emails you know, as you're writing them or you know, some degree of it, and they're gonna use that to sort of train an AI to uh, predict what you're gonna say next. And you know, that is something that's useful to them and to you. So just in conclusion, real quick, this is really old actually. Neural nets were invented in 1958. Really what has made this you know, get into a golden age is the fact that we have a lot faster computers. You know, if you wanna train a neural net, it is a lot of multiplication. It takes a lot of time to do. So this is really what has made it possible. But still, you know, we kind of, this is not, this is based off a field that's not fully understood. And what I mean by that is you know, neuroscience, psychology, they're not solved fields. So as these two grow and develop together, I think we're gonna to start to see a much clearer picture of how you know, what the human experience over, over, overlaps with, you know, what is simulatable with the machine, and you know, how that you know, interlaps, and you know, in what meaningful way you can do that. So you've all been really patient, and I did promise you a game, so we're gonna get right to that. And please don't look for a couple of seconds. You're all good, don't worry about it. So I hinted on social media that you would be at a little bit of an advantage if you like Overwatch, and what we're gonna do right now is guess the bot. So what I'm gonna do is name an AI from Overwatch, and you need you to guess if it's general or narrow based on the traits on the slide. And as you can see, the three we're gonna go through are Zenyatta, Orisa, and Bastion. So first off, we have Zenyatta, and I'm just, I think people can read that. So Zenyatta, the Shambhali found purpose they were not explicitly designed for, so again, that's something, they found a novel thing to do, and you know, Zenyatta specifically decided Hey boss man, you know, I like what you're doing, I really respect it, but you know, I really think we should be going and you know, hanging out with people and you know, directly communicating our approach. So he decided you know, to sort of go off and do his own thing, so that's you know, novel thinking right there. And you know, here are just some quotes, you know, being eager to learn is not the same as learning, and that next one's kind of a tongue twister, so please read that for me. And then hatred is not strategy, so just really give me, you know, don't think too hard, but just sort of give me a gander on what you think. You know, is this generally intelligent? Is this something that, you know, it very, you know, shows abstract command of reasoning and, you know, is very human-like behavior, just by a show of hands. Okay, okay, who's gonna say by a show of hands again that this is, you know, very narrow behavior? This is, you know, this is a chat bot, you know, we have this already, you know, he's just staying stuff with floating orbs. Okay, okay, well. So, I'm gonna say that Zenyatta is almost certainly general AI, and at the very least, the most intelligentomic. And the reason I'm gonna say that is because you see a lot of reasonable, well, not reasonable, but a lot of original ideas come out of them. And not only do you see that, you see a very clear and powerful use of abstract reasoning. That's really, really hard to do, especially for machines. Um, and again, you can see you know, him using that to sort of understand the act of learning as being separate from learning. You know, these are all really impressive, you know, possibly impressive things right now for a machine to be able to do. And next up we have Orisa. And you know, the background of Orisa is originally she was you know, a defense bot to defend a city, and you know, after you know, the Doomfist you know, broke them up, then the EP came in and sort of you know, gave them some upgrades and did some stuff like that. So real quick, we have direct responses to questions that tend to skim over contextual hints. So like you kind of misses double meetings and conversations. If you see conversations with Doomfist, you can kind of see, you know, not really quite either caring or understanding sort of the aggressive undertones of that. Uh, installed personality chore and on-the-job training. This is how you would train a, you know, a bot to do something, is again, like I said, you just hook it up with a brain and then say, go do this, do it, do it. And then after, after a long time of doing it, it'll get good at doing that. Um, and yeah, I hear some quotes, I do not dream as humans do, but you know, it is my desire to be the hero that EP believes I am. I am simply following my programming and you know, from Zenyatta to Orisa, it is rare that I meet one with such an unformed mind. Now, again, don't think too hard, but just tell me, for generally intelligent, you know, this is abstract, clearly very human-like command of reasoning, just raise your hands for me. No, don't be afraid to look at anyone else, okay. All right, who's gonna say this is narrowly intelligent by show of hands, says, oh wow, you guys are really smart, so. So yeah, I'm gonna agree with you. I'm gonna say this is almost certainly narrowly intelligent, and the way we can see this is that she's good at one specific kind of task, which is defense. And you know, defending the city. I am here to please my master. I am here to learn. You know, you see not a very wide scope of things that Ordisa is interested in, and you know, we also see a lot of sort of missing of double meetings and conversations. So like you'll watch conversations again with Doomfist, and it's like he's being aggressive and or doing the Doomfist thing, and then you know, she's just like, okay. You know, maybe that's apathy, maybe it's not understanding it. 
hard to tell, but you know, this is not something you would expect of something that is generally intelligent. And finally, we have Bastion. So, Bastion. Hard to find quotes for this, actually. But Bastion was created explicitly for the purpose of combat, and we can see this. Bastion is you know, a walking weapon, you know, guns, guns, and guns inside, everywhere guns. Um, reacts appropriately with audible emotional tones in response to dialogue. You can, again, see, if you look at my boop section right there, you can see he has happy boops, happy, sad boops, and bird-like boops. Um, demonstrates empathy and human-like emotions, such as fear. You can see this a lot with the conversation with Torbjorn in the comics, where, you know, he's just doing his own thing in the forest, you know, building a dam like giant robots do, and, you know, he comes along and is like, what are you doing here? And, you know, he's afraid and retreats. That, you know, generally Bastions don't do that, so that's really interesting behavior. And implied to have dreams by Zenyatta, yeah, that's, you know, quite an interesting thing for a robot to have. And then, you know, boops, I assume you can read. I mean, sad boops, happy boops, and bird-like boops. The bird-like boop is the most interesting because what it's doing right there is, look, it's empathy, you know, it's learning from the bird. Again, it's using that big brain of it to, it's like, how, you know, how do thing. It's like, oh, I must speak like this, you know, in bird-like boops. So again, don't think too hard of it, but, you know, just give me your good gander. Do you think Bastion is generally intelligent? Is he... Generally intelligent AI, okay. Now who's gonna tell me Bastion is a narrowly intelligent AI? You're just a walking killbot. Okay. So Bastion, I think, is the most, one of the most interesting cases, and it's because there's a special circumstance around Bastion, and it's the end of the Omnic Crisis, and we can see a lot of like abstract behaviors here, like understanding emotions is really interesting, and that's you know, really impressive for a robot to do, to be able to appropriately use emotions and you know, have novel behavior, like learning how to make a dam despite being programmed to murder. <laughs> but you know, the kind of the thing here that makes this special is that after the end of the Omnic Crisis, Bastion was you know, damaged and left to the elements for you know, a long period of time. So that kind of, kind of brings into question, like, is this really something that is generally intelligent, or is this just, you know, maybe it was damaged and lost memories? It's kind of a pseudo, you know, fake intelligence. You know, we, it's hard to tell, but I would say since we can still kind of see the scope is generally limited, you know, maybe Bastion isn't quite as good as fighting as the other Bastion units. You know, it's really hard to tell, and, you know, you can't really see from boops, you know, what, or maybe what the dreams are. Maybe it's just a building dams. I mean, I don't know, but... This is kind of the special case series. You know, we don't know, but I'm going to say it's an exceptionally flexible, narrow AI with you know, kind of childlike and very endearing behavior. So that is brings me to the end of my game. I will be hosting this on my website. Um, if you guys want to come and see this again or have any questions or want to talk about Overwatch, please hit me up. And thank you all so much for listening.